Hello, welcome to KCP community meeting September 28th. Uh, we have a few items on the agenda. Uh, the first one by complete random ordering is uh, Steve has been doing some work uh, on transparent multi shard list. I don't know, Steve, if you want to give it more of um, more of an intro than that, I can also describe at a high level what I think is happening, but uh, sure. let's hear it from the horse's mouth. Um, yeah, sure. So I think, I guess what I'm trying to work on is uh, making uh, like a sharded KCP deployment serve list and watch to clients in a transparent way. Um, and so the part that's working and I can show off today is uh, if the client's asking for a chunked list from like one KCP deployment and uh, sharding is enabled, then it'll fan out and sort of serve data from a bunch of different um, KCPs. And then the aggregate resource version of all of the uh, servers involved is, is returned. Um, and that'll be how we support watch in the future. So. Cool. So, Go ahead. Oh, just to, just to clarify the, this requires multiple KCP instances to each know about each other, right? So, so KCP. No, it just technically requires right now one KCP instance to know about others. But yeah, yeah but if we if we want like an entry point into any, then they all have to know about each other. Yeah, this would uh, I would probably say it is. This is actually even more general than KCP. What Steve is demonstrating is you could build a consistent list watch across two cube servers that expose the same version of an API object and build a combined view through some intermediary, whether that's on the client side or preferably a server which hides the complexity. That would allow you, if you have a consistent list of the membership of the clusters, you can then have a consistent list that a controller could use to act on those things consistently, such that um, you know either on the server side or on the client side, you could scale your controller to more than one cluster. Gotcha. So I think I, I think I had misunderstood, and it was helpful that I asked that question. Then, so this is not. Uh, if you have three KCP shards running, it's not that you can talk to any of them and they all aggregate across all of them. It's that one of them is special and knows about the other two, let's say. But and it, when you ask it for things, it will give you what it knows and forward on, like, and uh, uh, in the chunked response. That's also how I'm aggregating. Going to in the show it today, but there's nothing that okay. requires that to be the case, right? Like, I think yeah. having yeah, all there's of really them. I think I'm so having having um go. like having the client be completely agnostic to who they're talking to, like which primary um just requires that you have authoritative names for all of your shards. Uh which like just I hadn't tackled yet. Um but if authoritative names exist, then certainly the client couldn't take uh their request and give it to any new shard. Yeah, the, the 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 two actors are there's a something providing consistent list watch over a resource inside a cluster, or a, a cluster, and then there is something that can calculate in a, a a list and a watch operation over those that is consistent given the presence of an authoritative membership set. So it's kind of um, it's a little bit like transact. It's a little bit how etcd or other transactional systems work. Um, if there's a coordinator that knows where everybody is, there is an algorithm that allows you to use the coordinator to ask for information from various shards. The coordinator could be very light, and the specific guarantees that List Watch do, Steve is exploiting them to uh, demonstrate how a re how you can get kind of that consistent thing that a controller needs, which all of the cube operator controller pattern is based on can leverage across an arbitrarily wide number of servers in theory, which is a very unique thing that nobody's really tried to do before in the community. So it, it gives us an option for yeah. scaling a number of dimensions. Yeah, definitely. The, the, the coordinator would still be, or the coordinator could be replicated, but it would still be a single point of failure unless you did the 
if you reach any KCP instance, it will aggregate across all the others? Um, the so, coordinator needs to have a, to be able to offer the same guarantees of being able to list and wash with a resource version that any resource would offer. So like think about a controller is creating a local uh, copy of the information in a server and it is delivering that in a way that guarantees like ordering and like liveness. Like if you just made list calls, a cube server guarantees that the next list call you make is further in the future than the previous list call. Watch satisfies that. So in theory, what we're doing here is we're setting up the guarantees to allow you to say, as long, if the source of truth is also list watchable, that can also be started because the operations compose. If if you have a bunch of total orderings, and as long as you're you understand like you know the the connection between a cluster or the the source of one of the the chunks, you can build an arbitrary scaling infrastructure for like because you can be delayed, right? So like if I build a controller, I'm at a one or two second delay at most, most of the time from the upstream, but it could be a, a larger delay, but I don't care because I have a consistent view that I know that is some point in the past that is valid in self internally consistent. Mm -hmm. This then extends that to, I can look at a whole bunch of things and build a list that's consistent. But one of the nice properties is that you can scale, as long as that, that chunk is small, you can scale that through replication trivially so that someone can say like, oh, you know, you're like you have a list of shards that's authoritative. As long as you keep those guarantees of forward progress and all that, you could have a whole bunch of read replicas out there. And then you just have a guarantee that someone can ask for a new consistent list and get that up to date. So we haven't really talked about all the implications of it, but it basically means you could shard, you, you could shard and the, the core data can be effectively replicated and scaled in many many different ways as long as you guarantee some progress right you know if i if i want to make a shard change i might not want to wait three days for that shard change to propagate but we ha would have a system whereby one server could be a writable source but there could be many downstream readers that would potentially mean each shard could itself be a downstream reader and itself serve it if we really wanted to, or it could just be a completely separate orthogonal layer of right. shards that help you do reading. And this would be a component. I mean, this is a required component of any of those. Right, right, right. The, the, uh, the work that is being done is novel and useful. However, we deploy, however, that code ends up actually being deployed across whether the shards are each talking to each other or something is fronting all the shards or et cetera. Yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned, uh, uh, Clayton, you mentioned that this works for listing. This is intended to work for listing resources across uh, workspaces, across workspaces, across shards, and where the resource is the same type. Is that a restriction we're hoping to like? So I think the expectation was um, like, through, like I guess just a couple of cases, right? So if you're a controller that has been installed into workspaces by someone doing like an API binding of the resources that you operate on, you know the exact resource version, or sorry, the exact schema um, of the resource that you're you're worried about, and so in that case, you're able to ask. Uh, like a sharded KCP deployment, like please give me all resources um, at this like specific API version because I know the exact schema, and so we'd be able to index uh, which workspaces you end up getting data from by that. And, and that the is, truth, the truth and that, would be the binding. Yeah, and that membership set could be moved. Like the shard index is telling you what servers there are, but the shard index could. Uh, potentially be a resource shard index or a workspace shard index that could also tell you. So there's a couple different ways that we could do that consistency. And that's like maybe once we can, once we kind of have some of the parts done, that's then the next thing to go explore, which is what are the consistency trade-offs that would be useful? Like um, you brought up, Jason, if that shard index is down, you still want people to be able to, each shard should be able to serve that, a workspace or a logical cluster. The idea would then be, okay, well, 
there's themselves like guarantees that within that you want to provide consistency so that like you know all the API bindings. So you're kind of copying API bindings down. So you already are in a spot where you you need to have a transactional record somewhere that you can list watch on to build the list of all the things at the version. But you can also conceivably say in the absence of something, in the absence of that coordination, you still want to have a local consistent view so that someone can still submit write requests to write that particular resource. Right, I, I think my question was more, was less about uh, the, the, how the, how the system will work when the index is unavailable or, or how you will write and read at separate times, but more like, I think we talked about last time, the, the issue of if, if uh, your logical cluster says a deployment is these fields and my logical cluster says a deployment is just one single field called foo, how will I be able to list deployments across our workspaces? Or how will I even be able to request, like, give me all deployments that match this schema across all workspaces, so, across all shards? I think some expected work on David's end was going to start encoding uh, the specific schema, the hash mm -hmm. of it, or some, some, some derivative into yeah. the actual version. Nice. Um, and we had talked about, like, because again, there's, there's two cases where you end up like if you're a controller and you know the exact schema and you can determine that version, or sorry, you can determine that schema and that API version from the API binding, there's a source of truth on like a hash or whatever, like whatever identifier. Um, and so then you can make a very precise request. The other case that I thought of was the sinker, uh, which would need to go through discovery and ask questions like, what are the logical clusters that I am syncing from, what are the versions available in those? And then let me do a list there. And so those actually wouldn't end up being sharded lists because there's no guarantee that deployment would be the same across all the things that it's syncing. Although it would be, there is a nice property that um, if you have a backwards and forwards compatible schema, then all controllers today, like every cube controller is operating implicitly by saying, give me a specific uh, minimum version of the schema and mm -hmm. I will ignore things that are net newer. So like, if you think about, as we talked last time, yeah, like there's a schema UID that uniquely identifies some common schema and then it has a timeline into the future with unique versions that are forward compatible. All controllers today are implicitly saying they've got that hard coded LCD in their side and then they're hitting a server and just hoping those match up. In theory, um, you were trying to, we're trying to look at a bunch of shards with a bunch of lines with a bunch of things on different spots and our criteria is give me all the deployments of which you have at least this min minimum schema that is compatible and those two things could potentially then be pretty flexible but we would obviously need a, a more complex story under the covers to offer that but it may just be that's a very valuable property anyway so like a controller when it wants to go list something probably should check that um, you know, like if it if it needs a minimum version to function, there's no way to express that today. But you know, in the future, you might very well have that problem. So, and some of these may be problems that we just ignore. We're like, no, it's totally fine if you can just get a duck schema that's like, this is within the LCD of of the base schema we all support. Um, most controllers today just are perfectly happy being like, yeah, sure, I, I get that, and then you rely on operators and admins and packagers and distros to get that right. A yeah. Bit like, yeah. Controllers, single cluster controllers today only have to worry about the one dimension of time of, of the version of the schema changing over time and not about many different possible versions existing at the same time and moving across in time. Right. Right. Which at, at the trade off of then every every upgrade is a potentially traumatic upgrade. So then, yeah, the failure dimension is everything on the cluster. Right. I can see how we could encode the, like the hash of the scheme in the version. Like I am a deployment V1 hash of my open API schema, but I don't know how you would be able to, and that would allow you to list things that, things across all clusters that match exactly this schema. But I don't know how you would be able to encode uh, traits of that 
object yeah, or subsets it, of schema or compatible. It ends schemas. up being a disjoint thing, right? Like I think yeah. we'd need an API that says, yeah, like give me the things in this workspace that are at this LCD or like whatever. Yeah, that would be from that discovery side. And potentially, and I mean, I think this like matches to David, the stuff you were doing is the, um, the LCD, the LCD that you calculate across three physical clusters and the LCD that you would use as the controller, like what does it accept? Those are both identifiable. There's really a graph of compatible versions that most of the time just devol devolves to a line. So you're really just trying to put something, order it into a line and do that calculation. I, we were doing when we were doing back at the envelope scale numbers, which are in the the doc, um, the design doc. You know, we're, we're probably still talking about per server a thousand to ten thousand API types, and so a fully materialized graph per server is relatively cheap to calculate. That's deterministic. You can go from any schema. Now, if you change the schema in incompatible ways, that's already something we have to detect. Um, that would be the we're. How would we efficiently do that? But in theory, you would do it, just do a graph lookup and say, I can accept all of the, as long as I'm lower or higher than this increment or something, um, and as long as I'm compatible, I can successfully uh, take this object. Yeah, because the, the the question of compatibility, mainly the, the LCD algorithm is just um, um, implemented as a subtype relation. It's just, just a subtype, subtyping re relationship. So that um, you know, all the instances of one type uh, are supported by of one schema, supported by one schema are also supported by the other schema. So it's mainly just the, exactly the same relationship as subtyping um, regarding classes and instances. So yeah, it, it's so this is like a really good discussion too because it's like starting to highlight the are there any useful simplifications we could apply, and one of them may just be like we may be able to simply brute force and reject APIs that are not in a hierarchy and then say, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it's a controller that has to look across three different types um, or be associated with three different types. Like that's not the end of the world either because to the controller, they probably don't care about whatever that change is. So we, we may be able to like, we don't have to do the, the perfect solution here. There may be a very good like, brute force best effort duct type LCD kind of approach, which is you can probably reduce most of these down to, um, you know, a, a best effort that gets mm -hmm. things that are mostly compatible. And then just say, look, if you want strict compatibility, you can do this, but most people are just gonna be like, yep, I got a controller YOLO, here's my minimum CRD. Just tell me what I gotta go request and we can hide those problems from the user. Yeah, I think this also, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, because currently, even in the, in what exists with the API resource import and negotiated API resource is precisely um, that you reduce if if you opt for um, you know reducing the um, the negotiated uh, API resource by calculating the LCD mainly you just um, design this uh, line graph. I mean this this line um, by reducing. Uh, um, each time a bit more uh, the, the the LCD, but but then you can also have an API resource import that is really incompatible. That is that just that not only uh, removes some fields, for example, uh, but also add other fields. So in this case, we just uh, there is no way to enforce it. I mean, it, it will be refused well, in any or case. Or just yeah, or you just create it as a different line, right? Like. There's yeah, probably yeah, nothing sure. that says like, we're, we're kind of already in the mental model where we can be like, well, we can have three versions or 10 versions or a hundred different yeah, versions of deployment sure. that are all incompatible. Yeah, yeah, Making sure. it obvious that you have these incompatible versions is useful at the time that you try to add it. And, you know, that's, it's kind of like, we, we talked about this a while back, but it was like, we're, we're bringing yeah. the problem to the point at which you're like, hey, I've added this API to this controller. Oh, it's, it's not compatible with all these. Therefore it's its own unique thing. Cool. That's awesome. Um, I don't care. I can still use my incompatible one to list resources. Yeah, I think there's an opportunity to to uh, use this to surface a different kind of incom incompatibility. So right now, when you try to negotiate the API, we will block you and say like, or if it's incompatible, we'll say, hey, this is this requires human intervention. To these two types are incompatible. There's a, this introduces a new type of incompatibility potentially, which is 
your type that you're trying to change is compatible with both downstream things, but the controller that is watching for these things, the multi-workspace controller that is watching for these things, assumes traits of that resource that you are now not satisfying, which the downstream things that you're scheduling to might be fine with it, but the controller expected this field and you got rid of it. Is it think... um, like a, I thought when I was talking about David that uh, if you seed your KCP with resources, like the negotiation flow looks different than if it's derivative from the underlying clusters. Like I thought that if we were to have bindings, it would be authoritative downwards and instead you would fail to join. They, yeah, I think bindings could be authoritative and, and maybe this is just the, it's like the, what's the source of truth? Uh, but we might allow two different tenants to create the exact same incompatible resource because they are distinct things mm -hmm. um we'll probably have to we'll have to think about this more uh, there's a couple of the use cases i can imagine that maybe we just like we can skip or we can simplify down to uh like i i don't think most people will hit these problems uh it's more for the what would we use as the simplifying assumptions under the covers um and we, already with api bindings we, we know we're going to have to deal with forward evolution and then potentially like, you know, thinking about V1 beta 1 to V1 or V1 to V2, which CRDs don't really even solve. Um, mm -hmm. There may be some angles which were just like, well, let's just treat these as two different, completely, two completely different versions. The same tools that would help you go from a V1 to a V2 are that would help you go from this. I'm using V2 in the CRD sense, not in the cube. Like cube built-ins can go from V1 to V2. But the trick is, is that V2 has to be compatible with V1, um, except for certain behaviors. Uh, so V1 and V2 really aren't even, um, like most changes like that can only be done partially. So effectively it's like creating a new deployment when you create a V2. Um, okay, uh, Steve, did you have anything else you wanted to talk about uh with this or i have a, a demo with oh, great. some client stuff if we want to see it but it might not be i love a demo you want to look at a terminal for a bit i love celebrate terminals, terminals. <laughs> <laughs> oh i've got to uh request your share Uh, geez, this is not what I wanted. Okay, um, cool. So we have which basically starts two KCP instances and feeds the uh, cube config from the first one to the second one that sets up our shared situation uh, i attempted to create a bunch of service accounts and namespaces to show uh, i've i'm using impersonation right now to like attempt to make um iam work but service accounts are turned off so <laughs> we're not going to be doing that um then we look at the second shard, the one that has uh, is aware of the, the larger deployment, and we're just going to get namespaces, and we're going to ask it to chunk at one so that we look at the continued behavior. And the implementation this far is completely stateless and I believe has a minimum amount of deserialization involved. Um, we do end up having to mess with the objects that are getting passed back and forth. So if we look, for instance, um, at one of these namespaces, we'll see that uh, instead of just having a cluster name of an admin here, we've got also the shard that it came from. Um, mm. And so this nice. uh, 6443 is 
in comparison to here's one from the other shard. And these are at separate resource versions. So here's 136 and the other one's at 161. Um, and then if we look at the actual like responses and whatnot, uh, we've got the list coming back with a complex resource version. Um, and since all of that is encoded, I've got it figured out here for us to look at. So um, the first time we respond, our resource version just shows that we have uh, one shard with one version. Or sorry, this this call here is not a sharded call. It's I think some other controller doing something. Um, but yeah, so our first response here uh, has a resource version from one server, and our continue tokens um, record both uh, that we're like in the middle of chunking one of these, and we have yet to do anything for the other one. Um, and sort of as we move down, we keep ferrying that state back and forth, client to server, and by the time we're done. Uh, here we've got um, one shard at 169 and then one shard at 179. And then uh, this would be the complex resource version that a client would then ask for a watch to start at. Oh. Nice. And so if another, if another shard joined or if the resource versions of any type of that type on one of those shards changed, it would trigger a relist. Yes. So uh, in that complex resource version, the, there was a shard resource version as well, which is the point in time at which the deployment determined the total shards that had to be contacted. Mm -hmm. um, and then any any 410 that happens anywhere in like the delegation chain will just get bubbled up. Yeah, there's, it's good to do this exercise too, because like there's a bunch of the implications. Like uh, it was it was helping me write down as Steve was going through like what are the what are the assumptions of the list watch in the model? Um, like what data do you need? What does watch provide? Um, and like as we go through list, uh, one of the open questions that's been like a long time coming is it's a lot of work to list uh, multiple resources but listing multiple resources at the same time is roughly analogous to what Steve is doing right here, um, which is performing multiple list calls over multiple different resources. So the, for a long time, we've kind of had this tracking thing in cube of um, if you want to do, um, you can do lots of watches and that's fine. You can do lots of lists and that's fine. Is there a when you get to lots of resources, but a few number of objects per resource, things get kind of ugly. One of the interesting things this potentially opens the door to is listing multiple resources at the same time, the same way that it's doing, and then you could build a consistent list watch against them. It's a little bit different in structure, but it's the same problem fundamentally. So then you could potentially, you're, you're thinking about ways that you can improve overall controller scaling for things that have to watch lots of resources across mm -hmm. lots of shards, you could potentially even get to the point where, for instance, the sinker could say, I want to watch the resources that are in this cluster as long as you can get, or I want to get these set of resources across these things, as long as you can get that consistent set of resources, which means that you know the same guarantees around a resource version that increments forward that's consistent, you can then potentially build a, um, you could use that to build, to extend this model, to be able to implement that on a server side so that the client doesn't have to know about it, but the first place to start is a client. Right, that would help uh, That would help the sinker and our stuff. Because right now it's effectively doing uh, discovery, what types do you know about for each type, set up a list and a watch for each type. And instead we could just say, I don't care what you have, give me everything and tell me about every new thing. And discovery is not transactional today, nor can it be listable. Right. I mean, you can you actually you can actually emulate discovery in a certain fashion, but you can't watch it, for instance. Um, and one of the things, kind of thinking about this, would be uh, if somebody adds a new logical cluster on demand, obviously you want the controller to pick that up. So you already need to have that transactional change of the uh, works uh, logical clusters. You could see. 
But on resources, if you can add an API, you also need to be able to watch and know when an, a new resource is added, then you need to go through it. And then the, the corresponding other use case that this is starting to open up the door to is when we wanna move a logical cluster across shards, you want to be able to list watch everything in that logical cluster so that you can synchronize to the other instance with a simple controller pattern and then mm -hmm. potentially cut that over. So it, it's setting the stage for uh, three or four different very useful uh, characteristics that in theory, if we can, ju we're just extending list watch in one dimension, we don't require client changes to support. Do you, uh, the, the issue of moving a thing, uh, moving a, a logical cluster across shards, do you imagine that being facilitated by the help of this client logic? Like, does it, does this, or should it be completely opaque to the client? It, it's more like, um, you know, it would be complete. Uh, so the act of moving, so let's say you have uh, a bunch of logical clusters, you wanna move them across shards you need to have a membership assignment that allows the list and the wash to correctly and safely figure out when something's being moved. Um, mm -hmm. So there will be some implications on how you build the sharding logic. Like uh, the implementation of sharding assumes concrete types for the buckets. Uh, so where is you know, backing a logical cluster? And then it also assumes a concrete way to store where you are and where you're going a shard. And then that concretely assumes a shard resource. There could be many, many different types, many implementations of that, whatever, which, whichever one we prototype, we'll just be picking whichever one seems the most likely for the set of use cases that we imagine for heavily chunked multi-tenant applications on cube. Mm -hmm. But um, we would have to, there would be some implementation that effectively knows about in our case, in the case that we were kind of the terminology we're working through, a, a, sh a workspace, a workspace shard, and API sets that would effectively give all three of those. And the movement is just you're trying to figure out which APIs you have to move, asking a server, give me all your APIs. Even if an API gets added while you're moving, you, you still need to be able to make those work. But in theory, at that point, you have something that's arguably better than the Cube API server at managing API versions. And then we can come back and say, well, why isn't this just the Cube API server? Um, why wouldn't this be a fundamental capability? Yeah. Um, related to that topic, I spent uh, some time in the last week or so um, uh, working on the namespace, namespace granularity moving and scheduling across clusters, which also necessitated me writing another implementation of watch all things and discover new things um, and watch those things. Exactly the case that we're talking about simplifying and making better and more transparent to the to the client. So fully support the idea of making this something that the server can just tell me without me needing to do all this stuff. But um, I settled on what I think is a pretty good implementation and a pretty good API for set up an informer uh, that will notify me with the group version resource and an object uh, and let me do stuff with it, which I think is uh, if when this lands, uh, however it lands, I'm going to try to also get that stuff out of the sinker because the sinker does exactly the same thing. It says watch all things and discover new things and watch those too. Um, and I think that would be a useful uh, thing to get rid of. And then when the server that we're talking to is able to do this smartly for us, we can just swap out the client and just say, go, go ask for all things and all new things. Um, but yeah, I have uh, I have some code I will, I will link. I think I linked it in the Slack, but I'll uh, link it again and I'll send out a PR for it soon. Um, stay tuned for future demos. Um, David, do you have, you had items for, oh, I'm not uh, presenting anymore. Yes. Well, no, nothing really to, to demo, but just um, I wanted to give you a, a quick um, um, view about uh, the last work I worked on. Mainly fixed a number of, and still fixing a number of, of 
bugs or you know incomplete uh, behaviors inside the KCP server, mainly inside the Kubernetes uh, uh, feature branch, especially related to namespace management. So everything that was related to admission in namespaces was in fact not multi-cluster. So it was working as long as you were working with the admin logical cluster. But then, for example, if you wanted to create an object in a new uh, in, in a given namespace on a logical cluster user, you had to create this namespace with the same name on logical cluster admin, because it was searching all the namespaces for the admission and for anything else uh, in, in the default uh, logical cluster. So that's mainly the same type of work that um, was initially done on, on the CRD side to, to add CRD to Nancy. So completely, uh, completely partition all the CRD management and all the logic of the CRD controllers per logical cluster. And then we have to do that also for namespaces and, and namespace admission and also namespace controller. So um, in order to be able to delete a namespace, you have to clean up all the objects inside the namespace. But of course, there again, clean up all the objects that are living in the right logical cluster and not mixed logical clusters. Yeah, and, and David, I was gonna yeah. say for that, so don't don't be afraid to do a quick hack for the namespace controller or the simplest thing, because I think, and I was kind of playing around with some of this, this is what I mentioned yesterday. Yeah. Um, in the long run, it may be better for us to do transactional deletes of namespaces mm -hmm. uh, with a storage level. Like I'm, I'm kind of contemplating sure. yeah. mixing the current cubes, or not contemplating, but playing around with the, um, since we're already going to be like want to track APIs at versions, which is a little bit different yeah. than the way that APIs are tracked in Cube. Um, there's an implication there that may be a valuable property, which is we would effectively homogenize storage on the etcd, and every every object would be stored the same, have the same rules. So what would happen would be namespace deletion would really just be a um, scan yeah. the list of APIs at a current point in time in the cluster or in the uh, namespace and then delete all of them. And then namespace uh, workspace deletion would be very similar. It would be delete, find all the resources that are transactionally bound to a workspace, go and delete them from etcd. So there would not need to be a controller implementation per yeah, se, yeah, sure. yeah. Uh, but that's not, uh, don't worry about that yet. Cause I don't want, we don't want to commit to that kind of approach um, that will break aggregated API servers. The namespace controller is required for that behavior, but it might be that you know, there's a reason actually where we we support both models or something. Yeah, it really sure. depends so, on whether aggregated API is important or not for the mm -hmm. purposes of yeah what we're talking about with API evolution. Yeah. By Can the you... way, uh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. By the way, uh, for the namespace controller, so the deletion of objects inside a namespace, I already modified uh, the code, so it's mainly hacky. You just get the cluster name each logical cluster name each time and then um, create the right uh, you know um, client go request to to the right logical cluster so okay. it's it sort of works uh, now <laughs> it's a bit um, linked for example to uh, cluster roles because at start uh, post start hook you also try to we're so uh, with the, the role factory I think, tries to create new roles uh, right. or aggregated and, roles. And then again, you have to, to to be sure to point to the namespace in the right logical cluster. Yeah, so RBAC is one that I actually, I don't want us to do. So uh, we need to talk about RBAC, but it would be like, I think mm -hmm. uh, an avenue for investigation of RBAC would be, we don't want to create 300 objects per workspace. That's mm -hmm. bad. Um, we want workspaces to be cheap or logical clusters yeah. to be cheap. So. We need to talk about what the RBAC implementation is. It's mm. probably a layered model where each workspace has its own RBAC, but it's a hierarchy a little bit like CRDs where there's yeah. a um, there's an RBAC rule or there's an RBAC engine instance that's very lightweight sitting on top of kind of the default roles and all that. So we need to talk about what that would look like from a mm. caching perspective before we uh, jump in too far on it. Yeah, the, 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 the question, Currently, I mean, uh, on a very short term, is that as soon as we fix the namespace controller to at least be able to create a namespace and delete the namespace that has some something in it, I mean, for demo purposes or for other teams to work with it, 
then um, we have to minimally hack the, the um, uh, airbag aspect as well, at least for it to, to point to the right namespace in the right logical cluster, because as just KCP doesn't start up uh, anymore. So right. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to, to issue pull requests with the minimal changes on these related areas. And of course, uh, this has to be to be changed when we, we opt for a, a more. Yeah, and, and it's a, it's a, this is a good opportunity for us to actually go in and, and start sketching out what the story would be there, right? Like, how mm -hmm. do you yeah. keep a workspace or logical cluster lightweight? Um, and the, the things you're working through are, which caches do you need and which subsystems are different in this model? Like, admission behaves yes. one way, um, RBAC behaves a different way, um, aggregated yeah. APIs behave a third way, et cetera. Because we, we, are, we already have the pending work on, on COD tenancy, because that was our discussion from, from a long time ago, right. uh, that we should make it dynamic and not, and not controller based, uh, mainly, you know, COD publishing of open API schemas and all this. So Absolutely. That, that's the same yeah. type of, of, you know, problems that we encounter and refactoring that we have to foresee. And maybe it'd be useful then to like what we should document is what we are trying to get to for the purposes of showing and yeah, exactly. you know, being able to create namespaces in a logical cluster is very reasonable. Being able to do some minimal RBAC is very useful. Being able to delete a namespace in a logical cluster is very useful. And then everything beyond that is, um, you know, an input to a design um, that we yeah. can start with the set of problems we're hitting. Yeah, uh, that was a bit a plan as well to leverage on the on the small document I already did on in, in the feature branch, you know, with the main changes in the commits and also the post potential client uh, problems. And I was envisioning a third section about um, what would be the real and clean implementation or refactoring for each of those uh, main main points. Yeah, I mean, I, I think at this point, I'd probably say that feels like a Google document shared with KCP Dev that is a yeah, design okay. document for sure. logical cluster slash workspaces sure. that yeah. keeps cube properties, but you know is able to be as efficient as possible. And then mm. we should add whatever use cases we have in other places for things like, you know, I want to set up a set of RBAC rules that are consistent yeah. across yeah. a yeah. whole bunch of workspaces. Mm. What design would we need? to share those broadly. Yeah, I can I can create that as a as a Google Doc first, sure. Um, I don't know if there are any questions as I just had a, a last point. Um, uh, Joachim is here as well. And together we've been testing the KCP ingress, this KCP ingress work um, with the Envoy uh, proxy. Uh, on the dev workspace controller over KCP scenario that I showed uh, recently. Um, and we in control, so it, uh, unfortunately we cannot demo that because it's nearly okay, but not 100%. But at least it, it allowed on my side uh, spotting some areas of thinking, especially because it used the same approach as the initial deployment splitter. So, you know, you have uh, an ingress, you create one sub ingress per, per cluster, um, suffixed by the cluster name. And then, um, and in fact, uh, we encountered a number of problems with the dev workspace controller because it's mainly uh, watching for ingresses, cleaning the ingresses that according to its labels are not really useful or should not be there anymore. And the fact that we just duplicate ingresses with the same labels for example, just mess up um, the, the the logic of the controller, and it seems to me that we have that it opens a wider question about um, the fact to, uh, of creating additional objects that you know uh, uh, sub objects that we want to to sync to to physical clusters. The fact that they can be seen by um, client uh, controllers. In a number of cases, might be a problem because you know you just can end up creating an object that a given controller doesn't expect and might possibly just remove, for example. So that's yeah, that that that's something that we just fixed by filtering 
lab is an owner uh, on on the you know sub ingresses we create on the derived derived ingresses we create, but it seems to me that it's it's wider um, things to 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 think about any new object that we create only with the purpose of thinking should in my side be hidden or invisible uh, from uh, for for the the client controller. So yeah, yeah, I agree. the The creating creating uh, separate sub objects was a bit of a terrible hack to be able to sync multiple <laughs> things sure. down. We'd also talked about not having, like, if you split a deport the split a deployment across a hundred physical clusters, you don't want to have to store a hundred exactly. objects and update a hundred objects, and like mm -hmm. that turns into a right ampli amplification problem. So we talked about having some hand wavy thing of virtual resources or virtual uh, uh, per physical cluster objects that when a syncer says, give me a deployment for me or give me anything for me, uh, something else would answer that with, here is mm -hmm. the slice of a deployment for you and not have to store yeah. 100 copies of subsets of things. Uh, yeah. That was the last we talked about it. I don't think we went into more detail on it or, or, or maybe I missed <laughs> Uh, uh, maybe I don't remember how that ended up, but I so think some certainly, part... Go ahead. certainly there is an element here, which is, um, and we were kind of, Steve and I were talking about this a little bit, but like the, uh, the idea of a virtual workspace or virtual logical cluster, that's a little bit like an aggregated API, like it's interpreting what's going on. So like having one of those do that transformation would be potentially because like within that you'll have a set of APIs. So what APIs are gonna have? You're gonna have the APIs that the syncer expects to see that it needs to copy down to the cluster or L C D. Um, so there may be that'll be one mechanism, but I I think there may be others. One of the things that was kind of striking me is um we should probably draw a diagram of terminology for the different parts. So like we've we've been using logical cluster and physical cluster. We've talked about you know syncer has a terminology. When we talk about controllers, um, which level they run at, you know, delegated controllers um, or, you know, whatever it means when you let the underlying physical cluster manage the object. Um, we should probably come up with terms that uh, describe what a higher level, like a KCP level API object is, like um, control plane API versus physical cluster API or logical API versus physical API, whatever we come up with some terminology so we're all using the same phrasing um, and then talk about, you know, Anytime we have a, a lack of clarity, we show on a diagram what that what that actually <laughs> means. Like so that we're because I, I don't think we're we're starting to converge, but we haven't been pretty rigorous about it. Maybe it's time for us to to get really rigorous about terminology when we're talking about because I've noticed this this <laughs> clarity when I've been describing it to other people. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I had the, the the question, even more general question about um I don't remember exactly where we are about labeling, you know, or using affinity and anti-affinity. But anyway, um, any any attempt or of changing for the sake of syncing uh, to physical cluster, any attempt of changing the context that the um, external, you know, client controller that points to KCP and only sees KCP, any attempt at changing anything in this context is possibly error prone, I mean, possibly uh, just incompatible with the client, uh, what, what the client controller expects. I, I think there would be a statement, which is if you have a, so let's just say we're talking about logical APIs and physical APIs. Um, yeah. An API that you are creating, that you are getting transparent multi-cluster on has to be designed or be compatible with the idea that it is useful at both levels. And so as we, when we did the exploration work on the transparent multi-cluster, deployment is useful at both levels because a deployment yeah. is a chunk of things. Yeah, and sure. so the set of changes is minimal. Not every physical API is gonna make sense like that. And so we probably need a lexicon for, you know, kind of as you're saying, David, describe what API, what it means to be a physical API that is suitable for transparent multi-cluster. Conversely, define when that is not suitable such that you know no matter what magic strategy we come up with in the sinker it's just not going to make sense and say okay that may be a scenario where the logical api is actually distinct from what the physical api should be so like uh, an example would be 
uh, a logical API might be creating a um, creating a, a twelve factor app on Heroku. Um, so a Heroku deployment could be a logical API. It's not a physical API because there's not a con if there's yeah. a control there's just one controller talking to it. Whenever the syncer gets involved, whenever transparent multi-cluster is in play, there's a certain set of rules that apply to those objects. Um, a minimal set of transforms that transforms a high-level context into a low-level context, or a phys logical context into a physical context or something like that. Mm. I think there's still a, a problem with that, though, to David's point about uh, if one physical cluster is able to see the details of another physical cluster's you know, split of a deployment, for instance, it could mess with it or mess with its own or uh it has a lot of it, it, currently in the demo prototype status it has a lot of visibility into what right is happening and the, and it shouldn't because it's going to use that to yeah my, my point here is is really about visibility i mean mm -hmm. uh that uh, um a client controller pointing to a logical cluster should not uh see any change done by anything else than himself and itself or uh, what it expects from a typical cube to to do on on the resources it created and at, at the well, level. what what kind of client controller are you describing are you describing taking physical controllers that are no 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 not... I'm, I'm describing typically dev workspace controller which creates a dev workspace resource i mean which which reconciles a dev workspace resource and creates, uh, let's say, a deployment and some ingresses. Yep. So it's a it, it is a physical API today, but the argument is that it could be a logical API and a logical controller because there's nothing about it. All it depends on are deployments, or a yeah. couple other objects. But it's deploying. It's depending on an object that is itself a. We need to really come up with a name for this, like a a transparent multi cluster compatible API or follows yeah, yeah. the transparent multi-cluster yeah. rules. Therefore, if the transparent multi-cluster rules for deployment break the expectations of the of the uh, controller, mm -hmm. that would be the same problem as breaking a user expectation. So the, yeah, you know, yeah. the rule of thumb, transparent multi-cluster APIs need to behave 95% identical to their yeah. things. What we're, we're, we're kind of growing the aperture of things. We weren't really talking about controllers before. Now, this example, this physical controller moved to the logic to be a logical controller needs to, um, it expands the aperture of the 95% if we consider the use case of moving a controller from a lower level to a higher level valuable because it simplifies end user behavior. But in this case, I think it's a great one. Um, there was an example that was given, so for CRW specifically, um, how much how much of the behavior of the CRW type use case depends on looking at the details of what's going on in the pods versus the summarization provided? Very by few, in fact. Uh, I, I still um, saw in the code that it's um, watching pods, I mean, the, the, the main dev workspace controller. But to be fair, I only think it's just, you know, uh, to, to, let's say, ping the controller, I mean, to just, um, uh, push the controller to 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 act a bit more uh, quickly uh, when something changed to the pod. For example, you know to just de uh, detect that uh, finally your workspace is 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 uh, ready okay. to run. Because because the, the other example of this that's... deployment status. Yeah, but it can it can. So yes, yeah, sure, exactly. So I mean, there's nothing. For example, for now, um, obviously that uh, in in what I did the. Workspace controller is working at the KCP level, so it just doesn't see any pod because pods are not replicated from downstream to upstream, and it still works correctly and finally reaches the the, the ready state and and everything. So, and this was this is actually an example that we were talking about for etcd. So um, the HyperShift team was prototyping. You know, the etcd operator has some long-standing challenges. They were looking at alternate designs that made it more resilient. One of the ones they were mm -hmm. discussing that made sense for etcd was the idea of uh, making a wrapper, um, a layer that sits around each pod and is cube aware in the sense of being aware of DNS and other injected things into the deployment. So. In their, their use case, 
we were talking about, well, you know, all they're doing is creating a stateful set that's running an etcd binary plus the etcd wrapper that does the the necessary minimal configuration in a cube environment. It's a little bit like what Mesosphere prototyped with or did with Copilot. Um, you know, think of it as an embedded controller, an embedded operator from a terminology standpoint. But that pattern actually works really well from a logical and physical separation because uh, probably a lot like CRW, you put a little bit more logic close to each process and then you keep the high level stamping out, uh, you know, controlling deployment behavior up at the high level. That actually makes it easier to, um, you know, keep that controller completely detached from the physical mm -hmm. layer. You can just move it up just like you can move CRW up. I guess the thing I'm looking for then, David, is we should be looking at the examples of what are the missing things that, you know, a controller like that would lose out. You talked about readiness. Etcd uh, has like recovery scenarios, uh, backup, etc. We should look at what are the set of requirements for those kinds of logical clusters and treat those as uh, gaps in transparent multi-cluster. Like we talked about getting pod logs, being able to exec pods. Yeah, yeah. These are net new requirements for enabling physical controllers to move to logical controllers. Yeah, I started a, a draft document, but I should complete it also with uh, such things. And David, if you can think about terminology that we would use to describe this type of controller, that would be awesome. Like, is this a <laughs> is this an agnostic controller? Like something like uh, uh, level independent operator? We should come up with some terminology that allows us to identify this type of controller versus others. Mm. I think, for example, Tecton is going to be challenging in this way because it needs to see pods. Like it, it uh, create users create task runs. Tecton controller changes them into pods, creates pods, and then watches those pods until they're done. And then yeah, uh, I and I've spent you know the last six years telling people not to use mm -hmm. jobs. If you're building a high scale controller that needs to deal with pods, you should be using the pods directly because jobs just add another layer, and then you yeah, still have yeah, to look yeah. at pods most of the time. Um, I think that is a design input. Like we haven't really done the stepping through the pod example, but both Tecton and um, we should maybe look for like one Argo. other example. Argo, Argo, Argo the same thing. Where we, we are going to need to create a pod at the logical level. That's going to be hard because pods, a pod at the logical level is not the same thing as a pod at the physical level because a pod at the physical level has a finite lifespan and a pod at the logical level has an infinite lifespan from a truth perspective, and that implication is gonna get hairy. Uh, but I think that'll be really important for the job or batch style workloads, which is, uh, I was talking about this with Rob the other, or uh, was I talking about this with? I was had a long discussion with someone about like batch is gonna be pretty, batch could be one of the things that, that we truly enable. It's not what we've been spending most of our time talking about, but it's good that Tecton will be in there because I think getting Tecton to work really well yeah. is a core part of stateless or you know applications service applications uh, you yeah. can't really build them without being able to to do ci of some form i think batch is actually a really good fit for all of this because we don't have to be so tight on latency you know like failing over from one cluster to another we don't have to do it you know in a millisecond when nobody notices we can we can have 15 seconds of downtime in your mm -hmm. ci pipeline and in the meantime we moved your entire thing to a different cluster you're welcome like seems like a very like an even better fit than application moving but right and we'll have to define some we, we may actually end up having to do things with pods that we don't have today like at most once and at least once semantics mm -hmm. um because cube is definitely an at least once system mm -hmm. for some parts but there are there are definitely places where you need the at once or at most once behavior and yeah. we need to think about what those mean you're reminding me of a very fun tecton bug we had where when we asked for a pod we got two pods uh, and yep. what do you do anyway? Uh, we're over, we're over time, but this has been, uh, very helpful. I will post the recording soon. And if you have any notes or things you'd like to discuss next time, feel free to add those. All right. Have a good week, everyone. Bye.